Welcome back. Let's start with this example. We have that an investment manager had a fund of $120,000 at the start of the year. On February 1st, a withdrawal of $20,000 was made. On September 1st, a deposit of $20,000 was made. And at the end of the year, the fund balance was $125,000 to determine the dollar weighted rate of return. Okay, and so hopefully it's fairly obvious in this problem that we are going to be solving for the dollar weighted rate of return, right? Our problem tells us that explicitly. And so in order to calculate the dollar weighted rate of return, we need to make note of the initial balance of our fund, the ending balance of our fund, and all of the cash flows in between. And so that might be a deposit or it might be a withdrawal. In this case, we have both types of cash flows. We have a withdrawal of 20,000 and a deposit of 20,000, both at different times throughout the year, but we still have one of each regardless. All right, and so when you wanna solve for the dollar weighted rate of return, I recommend that you draw a timeline for the scenario, and that will help you keep track of what the balance is at the beginning and end of the year, as well as those cash flows. And so in this case, we're going to have four moments in time that we are interested in that we need to make note of on our timeline, right? We're always gonna be interested in the beginning of the year and the end of the year because we have an initial balance at the beginning and a final balance at the end. But in this case, we also have two cash flows that take place at two different times. And so that gives us a total of four dates of interest. And so let's draw our timeline here. I'll start by drawing the beginning and end points. And then we will have two points in between. And so the beginning of the timeline will be at the beginning of the year, which will be January 1st. And then our end point is the end of the year. And so that will be December 31st. All right, and so before we fill in the rest of our dates, let's write down what the balance is for the fund at the beginning and the end of the year. And so we're told that the fund has $120,000 at the start of the year. And so I will write 120,000 at the beginning of our timeline. And then at the end of the year, we're told that the fund balance was 125,000. And so I will write 125,000 at the end of our timeline. All right, and so then how about these other two dates that we wanna make a note of? We were told that on February 1st, a withdrawal of $20,000 was made. And so we'll label this with February 1st. And since we have a withdrawal of $20,000, I'm going to write minus 20,000, right? When you have a withdrawal or deposit, you wanna write either a negative sign or a positive sign to indicate that those are cash flows and not the balance of the fund, right? The only time that you're going to be looking at the balance for a dollar weighted rate of return is the beginning and the end of the year. Okay, and so then also we know that on September 1st, a deposit of $20,000 is made. And so our other date will be September 1st and we will have plus 20,000 because that 20,000 is being deposited or added to the fund. All right, so now that we have set up our timeline, we can set up our equation of value to represent this scenario and that will help us solve for the dollar weighted rate of return. And so remember, the dollar weighted rate of return is based on simple interest. And so we will be using the accumulation factor of one plus I times T to accumulate our interest as we set up this equation of value. So keep that in mind. We are not working with compound interest here. We are working with simple interest. All right, and so then to set up our equation of value, we are going to set up a future value equation where the balance at the end of the year is our future value of our initial balance and our cash flows. And so what we'll have is that the future value of $125,000 is equal to the initial balance accumulated for the entire year. And so we'll have 120,000 times the accumulation factor for simple interest, which is one plus I times our value of T. And so in order to determine our value of T, remember that the beginning of your timeline is T equals zero and the end of your timeline is T equals one because this takes place for just one year. And so every time period in between will be a fraction that is less than one, right? All your values of T in between here will be fractional values instead of whole values, all right? But in this case, we need to accumulate the initial balance for that whole period of time, for that whole year. And so we will multiply by one. That will be our value of time. All right, and then we'll move on to our withdrawal. So we will subtract 20,000, and that will be multiplied by one plus I times our value of time. And so in this case, that value of time will not be one, 
it will be a fractional value of time, right? And so what you want to do is count the number of months that this withdrawal will accumulate interest for. And so since this withdrawal was made on February 1st, we want to count the month of February and all of the other months of the year. And so the only month that we're not counting here is January. And so that withdrawal will be accumulating interest for 11 out of the 12 months. And so that will be our fractional value of time that we will multiply by the interest rate. All right, and so then let's move on to our deposit, which is made on September 1st. And so we will have plus 20,000, and that will be multiplied by one plus I times another fractional value of time. And so in this case, how many months are between September 1st and the end of the year? Well, that will include September, October, November, and December. And so that is four months out of the whole year. And so our fractional value of time will be four divided by 12. All right, and so this is our equation of value that will represent the investment fund for this problem. And we can use this to solve for the dollar weighted rate of return by solving for I in this equation. And so what we're going to do is distribute each of these values through these quantities, and then we will add up our like terms and then solve for I. Okay, but to make that a little bit easier, notice that the coefficient of each of our terms has a common factor of a thousand that we can factor out. And so what I'm going to do is just divide each of these terms by a thousand, and that will make it a little bit easier to work with here. So we don't have to write as many digits. And so what we'll have is that 125 is equal to 120 times one plus I minus 20 times one plus I times 11 divided by 12 plus 20 times one plus i times four divided by 12. But note that four divided by 12 could be rewritten to be one third. And so I'll just write that as one third. And so we'll have one divided by three. And so now this equation will be a little bit easier to work with since we have less digits and we can solve for i a lot quicker. Okay, and so if we clean up our work here, we can multiply 120 through this quantity. And so we'll have that 125 is equal to 120 plus 120 times i, then we will subtract 20 times one, and so that will be 20, and then we'll have negative 20 times i times 11 divided by 12, and so that will be equal to negative 20 times 11 divided by 12 times i, and then we will add 20 times one, which will be 20 plus 20 times i times one third, and that will be equal to 20 divided by three times i. Okay, and so now what we can do is add up our like terms and simplify a little bit. We have three terms that are being multiplied by i, and then we have these three terms that are just constants that we can add together. And so we'll have that 125 is equal to 120 minus 20 plus 20, but notice that negative 20 and plus 20 will cancel out, right? Negative 20 plus 20 will just be zero. And so we just have 120, and so I'll write that down, and that will be added to this 120 times i, so we'll have that, and then 20 times 11 would be 220, and divide that by 12, and you will have 55 thirds. And so we'll have minus 55 thirds times i, plus this 20 thirds times i, and so we'll have 20 thirds times i, and so now we can add those two fractions together. We have negative 55 thirds and positive 20 thirds, and so that will be equal to negative 35 thirds. And so I'll just rewrite that as negative 35 divided by three times i, all right? And so then if we clean up our work again, we can simplify this further by subtracting 120 from both sides of this equation. And so if we subtract 120 from 125, we will have that five is equal to this 120 times i minus 35 divided by three times i. And so if we rewrite 120 to be a fraction of thirds, that would be 360 divided by three times i, right? We just multiplied this value by a form of one of three divided by three, and three times 120 is 360. And so if we subtract 35 thirds times i from that term, we will find that five is equal to 325 divided by three times i. Okay, and so then all we need to do to solve for i, which will be the dollar weighted rate of return, is to divide both sides by this fraction, which would be the same as multiplying both sides by the reciprocal of this fraction. And so we will have that i is equal 
to 5 times 3 divided by 325, which if you calculate that in your calculator, you will find that I is equal to 0 0.0462 and some more decimals. And that will be your dollar weighted rate of return, which we write as DRR. And so this is the final answer to this problem. We found the dollar weighted rate of return for the investment fund in this problem. All right, so here's our second example. We have that given the following information about the activity in an investment account and the dollar weighted rate of return is 10%, determine the value of X. And so here we have a table that has some dates throughout a year and the balance of the fund on each of those dates, as well as when a deposit is made and a withdrawal is made. And all this means right here, the fund value before D slash W just means the fund on that date before a deposit or withdrawal is made. We're actually not gonna pay too much attention to this column except for the beginning and end date. This is just some extra information that we don't need for calculating the dollar weighted rate of return that is just provided to maybe confuse you a little bit, but we actually don't need these two middle values and I'll show you that in just a second. Right, and so this problem is a little bit different than our previous example. In this case, we are already told what the dollar weighted rate of return is. And so we are going to use that rate to solve for a value that is used to calculate our deposit and our withdrawal. Okay, so in this case, we know that I, which is equal to the dollar weighted rate of return is equal to 10%, which is 0 0.10 in decimal form. Or we could just write it as 0.1 if we wanted to. Okay, and so let's draw a timeline out for this scenario, even though we were given this nice table with our dates and our fund values and our withdrawals and deposits, it's gonna be way easier for us to analyze this problem if we draw our own timeline. Okay, so always take the few extra seconds to draw a timeline. It's going to be very helpful for solving problems like these. All right, and so we have four dates that we are interested in here. And so our timeline will also have four dates. We'll have the beginning date, the end date, and then two dates in between there. And our first date is January 1st. Our second date is July 1st. Our third date is October 1st. And our last date is December 31st. Okay, and so then we're going to transfer the important information from this table to our timeline that will allow us to use the dollar weighted rate of return to calculate the value of X, right? So on this timeline, the only fund values or the balances of the fund that we need to know are the beginning balance and the end balance. And so like I said earlier, we are not interested in the balance on July 1st or October 1st. We just want to know the balance at the beginning on January 1st and at the end on December 31st. And so on January 1st, it's $100. And so I'll write $100 here on our timeline. And on December 31st, it's $120. And so I'll write $120 right there. All right, and so then we have a deposit on October 1st of two times X. And so we'll have plus two X on October 1st. And then we have a withdrawal on July 1st of just X. And so that will be minus X, okay? And so now we have a timeline for this scenario that we can use to help us set up an equation of value that can be used to solve for X in this scenario. And so to set up the equation of value, we will have our account balance at the end of the year as the future value of the initial balance and our cash flows or our deposits and our withdrawals. And so we will have that 120 is equal to our initial balance of 100 times the accumulation factor for simple interest of one plus the interest rate, which we actually know in this case, we know the dollar weighted rate of return is 0.1. And so we'll have plus 0.1 times the amount of time that that needs to accumulate interest for. And so since that is the initial balance, it needs to be accumulated for the entire span of that year. And so we will be multiplying by one because the beginning would be time equals zero and the end would be time equals one. And so the amount of time would be that whole value of one. Okay, and so then we will subtract our withdrawal of X and that will be multiplied by one plus the interest rate of 0.1 times the amount of time from when that withdrawal is made until the end of the year. And so in this case, the withdrawal was made on July 1st. And so including July, the amount of months left in the year would be July, August, September, October, November, December. And so that is a total of one, two, three, four, five, six months. And so we will have a fraction of six divided by 12 for our value of time. And then we will add our deposit of two times X 
and that will be multiplied by 1 plus the interest rate, 0.1, times the fractional amount of time that is left for the year when that deposit is made. And so in this case, our deposit is made on October 1st. And so including October, we have one, two, three more months in the year. And so we will have a fractional value of time of three divided by 12, okay? And so now we have our equation of value set up. And so now we can solve for x in this equation by simplifying our equation, okay? And so if we clean up our work here, I just made our timeline slightly smaller so that we have some more room to work with here, but we'll have that 120 is equal to 100 times one plus 0.1 times one. 0.1 times one will just be 0.1, and so one plus 0.1 will be 1.1, and then we will subtract x times one plus 0.1 times six divided by 12. That will be one half, right? Six divided by 12 is one half, and so one half of 0.1 would be 0.05. And so we'll have one plus 0.05, and so we'll have 1.05 plus two times x times one plus 0.1 times three divided by 12. Now three divided by 12 is the same as one fourth, and so one fourth of 0.1 would be 0.025, and so one plus 0.025 would be 1.025. Okay, and so then if we clean up our work again, we can simplify further and have that 120 is equal to 100 times 1.1, and that will be equal to 110, minus x times 1.05, so we will have 1.05x plus 2x times 1.025, and two times 1.025 will be 2.05, and so we will have 2.05 times x. Okay, and so then we can combine our like terms. We have two constants here, and then two terms that are being multiplied by x. And so if we subtract 110 from both sides of the equation, 120 minus 110 will just be 10, and that will be equal to negative 1.05 times x plus 2.05 times x. And if you add those two values together, you will actually just get 1x, which would just be x, right? And so now we have just found that 10 is equal to x, and so we can conclude that x is equal to 10, and that is the final solution to this problem, right? And so overall, that was a pretty simple process to solve for x. We just had to set up our equation of value using our timeline that we derived from the given information in this table for this problem, okay? And so if we wanted to, we could figure out what the amount of the withdrawal was and a deposit now that we know that x is equal to 10. We would see that the withdrawal is equal to 10 and the deposit would be equal to two times 10, which would be 20. Okay, and so that is the end of this problem and it is the end of this example's video as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.